These are challenging, scary, and uncertain times. We're facing a pandemic that could last for months and may last for more than a year. Hi, I'm Harv Bishop from harvbishop.com, where we explore new ideas and re-envision spirituality. Now, in terms of manifestation practices, prior to this lockdown, my wife and I were visioning walking the streets of Paris. Since the lockdown, we've been working on manifesting a full pantry right here at home. And maybe things that you've been thinking about manifesting have been shifting too as we re-examine our values and, and just so many things now as we face this new, new normal. And we have your back today. We have scripting. It's a, it's a brand new manifestation practice uh, that can accommodate both long-term goals like visiting Paris and short-term goals like expanding your pantry. You can think of scripting as a combination of a daily planner and your vision board. Now, our guest, Royce Christian, has written this fascinating new book called Scripting the Life You Want. And he joins us today to talk about all things about the scripting process. We start out our conversation with a, a New Thought in, Insights on um, the COVID-19 epidemic and uh, a lot of interesting stuff. And, and Royce has worked on scripting for, for 20 plus years and, and he's experimented and he's explored and he's grounded it in science. And he has done a lot of trial and error and kept only what works. Mitch Horowitz has called this one of the most exciting manifestation practices that he's seen in recent times. So check out my conversation with Royce and at the same time, uh, be well, stay well. Uh, we're all rooting for you here. And uh, my conversation with Royce begins now. So let's, let's take a, a, a brief detour, but it's not really a detour. And uh, just sort of talk about uh, there's a lot of panic, a lot of fear, uh, and you know a lot of uncertainty around the uh, coronavirus epidemic. It's it's changing our lives in unprecedented ways. Uh, we're doing this interview on Zoom because of geographic distance, but chances are, if I was in LA or if Royce were in Denver, we'd still be doing a Zoom interview. So I, I um, literally had to take my book tour online, uh, which is fine. But yeah, I mean, exactly what you said we. It's been really interesting watching the, the scheduling of talks and everything, which is obviously necessary. Uh, but yeah, we, we, chances are absolutely uh, <laughs> because everything I have uh, is, is online. But honestly, you know, I get to be in my pajama pants. So that's, that's nice, a little bit more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, as, as you noted in the, in, in the introduction to the book, you, you, you lay out a lot of things about what, uh, what these kind of practices and tools will do and not do. And one of the things you really stress is you still want to see your doctor, so. Yeah, uh, it's, it's funny because I, I wrote the book at the, the last two months of 2018. Um, and in the introduction, hopefully, I, I don't know if I was too harsh, but um, you know, you, you, brought, you brought up actually a couple of the points, which is a lot of times there, a lot of the, the attitudes that I've found with not everybody, but a majority, I would say, to some extent, of the belief systems and the practices, like you said, not necessarily the teachers, but there's this sort of built-in idea that, uh, you know, if someone died some horrific death or someone got sick, that it's their fault. And I don't, I don't like that. I get really, it gives me the creepy crawlies when I hear certain people say that even, like, you know, you hear like 9-11 or some horrific event like the Holocaust and then the explanation is that perhaps their vibration wasn't good and to me that's just bull like it, it just doesn't it never has felt right to me so that's that's one aspect and what I what I talked about in the introduction again that was written you know a year and a half two years ago is I don't say scripting is going to heal your illness and if you need to go to the doctor go to the doctor that's what I truly believe I'm also so very happy that it's in there considering the timing of this coming out you know in April and May of, or April of 2020 and then May everywhere else uh, it's 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 something that I think is crucial because of this here's the thing I think there are many incredible untapped abilities that we have as humans and with that 
yes, there have been people who've done incredible healings, all sorts of things. However, we do have an ingrained built-in belief system uh, about medicine and doctors. And to me, the way I personally have always looked at uh, Western medicine is, look, if there is a cure or, 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 or doctors available, I've attracted that cure or those things or those medicines to me. That's my manifestation. And if I'm avoiding that, then I'm saying no to the universe when they're trying to present sometimes a very simple tool, whether, you know, and of course we can go into the weeds of all the different philosophies of medicine. But for me, I mean, I grew up in a very Western world and most people did who, who are probably watching this. And if you have a great doctor or a great over the counter medicine, then you've attracted that in my belief, it's, it's, it's part of the whole. So I always tell people, you know, if you can radically just, it's not, very easy, but if you can radically transform your belief system to not include medicine or, or, or the Western world, then maybe you could not right away consider other options for healthcare. But the reality is with everybody I teach it for myself, I go to the doctor. I'm not, you know, I talk about it. It's very taboo in, in, in this world that we're in with, with new thought and spirituality. And that has always bugged me. Um, but what I found is behind closed doors, most people that I've worked with and taught and been, uh, you know, uh, who have taught me, they do go to doctors and they do utilize Western medicine. So um, especially right now, I'm very happy that I, I included it in the book, but it's also really important for people to, to take into consideration with everything, like you said, going on right now, our lives have radically transformed and scripting is fantastic for uh, mental health and, 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 and for keeping a good attitude, which is all part of the whole uh, with what we're dealing with on a day to day basis. I think, you know, keeping our minds strong and uh, using the time maybe differently than we would have just a few months ago and turning it into a positive is, is important. And that's why I'm really grateful that this book is coming out when it is. Someone asked me earlier, actually, they didn't ask me, they said they felt really bad for anybody who had a book coming out. And I said, well, you know what? I'm really grateful because to me, this is one of the best tools for staying mentally strong. And you can do it in your house. You could do it with a computer or a notebook. It's very easy. It's a lot of fun. You could do it with your partner or your friends. And you could see results even if you don't leave your house. On top of that, you know, for me, like I love teaching this stuff. I'm really grateful I have a book coming out, of course. But, you know, I love doing shows like this and interviews like this because people don't need to buy the book to utilize what I teach. And I think right now that's more important than ever with everything that's going on. Um, you know, hopefully they will take the methods and the stuff that we're going to talk about today and utilize it while all this crazy is going on with the corona uh, coronavirus and enjoy it. And if they remember that uh, they like scripting, maybe they'll, they'll go buy the book next year or the second book or whatever. It's not really about that. I think right now it's about just all being in this together and and hopefully we can provide what we can from our uh from our little corner of the world if you will um and i i it's it's a little bit interesting because i i kept thinking to myself um uh i hope that i don't turn people off this is terrible but unfortunately like i said it's a reality of this world of new thought and for child for for, for a couple months after i you know the book was picked up and we were in the process i never wavered on not including the aspect of please go to the doctor. I'm not going to tell you scripting is going to cure it, anything. Um, and I, I just had this, oh, I hope that's okay. Now I'm really glad I listened to my gut because it is how I feel. And, and it is really, it's really, really important for people to listen to the CDC and the World Health Organization and their officials and what's with what's going on right now. Uh, we don't know everything. And I think that if you're not feeling well and, you know, there are some teachings out there that tell you just to just basically think your way out of it. Right now is not the best time to, to, to practice uh, to see if that works, especially when we're really all looking out for each other. Um, so I, I'm glad that we're, we're talking about this and hopefully people can get the really great benefits of scripting, which is really fun and it's, it's really great for your mental health. And uh, they also hear the message, please listen <laughs> to, 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 to the doctors and the health officials because that's, that's important and look, if you're feeling great, 
or you're feeling healthy right now, great. You, you are doing something right in your spiritual work or your, your, your uh, manifesting, whatever you want to call it. If, if you get sick though, it's not that you've done something wrong either. Uh, remember like what we just said and what I said, you, there's a lot of amazing doctors and, and hospitals and there's finally now uh, they're passing uh, it, people are able to get tested. Hopefully the tests sound like they're coming in. And, you know, I don't know when this, whoever's watching this, when they watch this, hopefully this won't even be relevant anymore because everything is get, getting back to normal or totally back to normal. But I think people need to keep in mind that, you know, we live in uh, a world where there is a lot to absorb. And like we talked about in the first video with perception and what we bring into our lives, you, no one should be beating themselves up for being where they're at right now. That's all of us. Me, you, Harv, everyone watching this, we are where we are and that's okay. And that honestly is something that can be looked at through the lens of this stinks or, hey, how can I use this time and what's going on to maybe do some self-enrichment or, or learn or research or whatever because we are all in the same boat globally right now. Like you can't go anywhere that's, that's in a different situation for the most part, you know, everybody's at home. And I think that there is definitely a mental health benefit to seeing the positives in what you can do now that you're home. And things are a little different, yes, but beating ourselves up and feeling bad or worrying about what's going on, manifesting or into the law of attraction or not, it's not helpful. It's just, there are other things we could occupy our time with. I know I've been doing it. Uh, and, and, it, it's it's understandable people are scared right now and people are feeling really confused i would say i've noticed just with people that i've talked to and that is the other point it's okay to be confused it's okay to feel like you don't know what's going on or what's going to happen i maybe confusion isn't the right word as much as just uh perplexed or or, or not knowing what's going to happen next that's okay too it's okay to be where we are and know that you are where you are. And at any moment, remember every moment is kind of a new beginning. It's not kind of, but it is a new beginning. So at any moment, you can just take a deep breath and you can say, all right, I'm gonna focus on my health and my life and I'm gonna enrich myself during this time. I'm gonna to listen to what's going on. And we should be grateful that we do have amazing officials and doctors. One of my best friends in the world, she endorsed the book, she's in the back, Dr. Dina Grayson fantastic information. Uh, you can find her on Twitter. She has a website. People like her, uh, there are many great doctors out there speaking out, doing live YouTube videos and, uh, you know, the, the CDC and the WHO, the resources are there. So if you want to look at it from an attracting law of attraction lens, we're attracting all these wonderful, helpful people and information. And the way I'm looking at it is I'm not super worried about why we got here. I just focusing on all the amazing resources we have. And I'm really grateful that we have the internet, which could you imagine this happening 20 years ago, even 10 years ago? You know, it, it, we are so lucky to have the ability to switch like we did. Look, look, you know, some people, I know I had a couple moments here and there where I, you know, look, it's my first book. Anybody out there who has a, you know, a dream or, or a passion, uh, Mine has always been to release a book. I, I've been really fortunate to do a lot of things in my life. I've been an actor my whole life. I've you know, done a lot of awesome things and I've had a lot of dreams come true and I've manifested a lot of things. This book is obviously a manifestation. I so deeply know that this book is going to help people and do what it's supposed to do no matter what is going on that I trust, you know, where it is and where it's going, when it's coming out and why it's happening now is part of whatever we're all attracting into the world. And that applies to everybody with everything. You can look at it from uh, a lens of this is really bad and I'm stuck at home, or you can look at it like I've been looking at it, which is, wow, we were able to, at the top of this interview, talk about, you know, the book tour being moved online. That's amazing. That's it just the, the, the resources we have to still keep in communication and keep in contact and the free things that we have um, to, to, to do this is it's just incredible. And again, 10 years ago, even maybe sooner, it, it would not have been possible. So I think we're going to find a lot of good in the situation. And I think, yeah, it's going to be a really weird 
perhaps road. Uh, but I think that if everyone keeps focused on the benefit and also as long as everyone is smart and, and listens to the advice that we're being given, I think we're going to pull through. I really do. And it's important to, to keep up uh, your mental health as much as it is your physical health right now. And that's the piece I hope we can bring to people, uh, you and I, Harv. <laughs> Very, very well said, you know, thinking about your point about technology, uh, my day job, um, it's in one of the, uh, it's U Denver, it's on one of the largest, um, you know, urban campuses in the area. And uh, literally within the space of two weeks, uh, the entire university is shut down, but migrated online. So there's no disruption in the classes. And it, I mean, it's that, amazing. It is. I mean, that's something that would have, um, not been the case before. So well said, Royce. So let's dive in and uh, define what scripting is for people and, and what makes it different, what makes it so effective, and how people can use it. All right. Uh, just a few short things right now. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, like you said, uh, so uh, I grew up in a, in a household that thoroughly believed and taught me new thought and the power of positive thoughts and the idea that you can attract anything into your life. So I, I, I want people out there to hear this story. It's a little, it, it, it would sound a little weird if you didn't have that background, knowing that this was the, the world I grew up in. Now, it wasn't an extreme version of it by any means. It was, you know, my mother, my grandmother, and to an extent, uh, my whole family, really. I mean, they all, uh, no one would have bat an eyelash when I was little about the idea of uh, using the power of our minds to bring things in, whether that was through visualizing or thought. Um, so when I was uh, 15, and this is the opening of the book, I tell this story. Uh, we were on, uh, every year my family would vacation. I grew up on the East Coast in New Jersey, right outside of Philadelphia. And um, we would go down to the Delmarva Peninsula. So Del for Delaware, uh, Mar for Maryland, and then Va for Virginia. It's this little sliver, if you look at a map, sticking out on the outside. And they have barrier islands. And the island that we always visited, uh, there's two, uh, Chincoteague and Assateague. And Assateague as wild horses, for real, <laughs> they do. Uh, they, 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 there's a lot of stories of how they got there, but they got there somehow. But on the beach, it's very, it's amazing. There's no humans. It's a national park, so you stay right, you know, the equivalent of maybe two city blocks of a bridge over on on Chicoteague Island. So we would go there every year, and um, you know, I was in high school at the time, and the best friend in the world, or a couple best friends, and I finally got out of my really. I had a, a weird middle school. I was acting, so I didn't have a normal, like, I didn't have normal schooling through, through sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and I had made a decision I wanted to have normal sort of high school, so I, I, I was taking a little bit of a pause from theater. I wasn't as terribly dorky, just semi-dorky uh, at this point, and uh, so I had a great group of friends. I was really happy, and my best friend and I got in this horrific fight, and both of us were stubborn and just would never, ever admit that the other one was wrong, and um, I was in a bad mood because I was Basically, even though I was happy to be going on vacation, my family to this little island, um, I left things sort of in shambles. I finally had a group of friends and my best friend and I were just in a terrible fight. And uh, my mom could see on my way down uh, as we were driving, it's about a four hour drive, that I wasn't in a great mood. So really funny, uh, she somehow got enrolled or enrolled herself in a book club for spiritual books. To this day has no idea, this was back in uh, 2003, no idea where the, these books just started coming. She would just pay for them. She doesn't remember ever signing up for this book club. It's, I'm sure she did, you know, but it's just kind of a funny story that this book literally kind of came out of nowhere. So she had gotten from that book club, she doesn't know how she signed up for, a book called Excuse Me, Your Life is Waiting by Lynn Grabhorn, uh, which was originally published in 1999. So we're talking a good six, seven or more years before The Secret made the Law of Attraction very popular. Uh, it was a New York Times bestseller, so uh, it was. It had been around for a little while. My mom hadn't read it, but it, she knew about it, and it got sent to her in the mail through this book club, and she didn't like it. So she saw I was not in a great state of mind. I was really upset, and she handed it to me. She's like, here. So this book was incredible to me at the time because the thing that I never 100% got, if you will, from, from the idea of positive thinking, creating things. And I had had luck, like my mom definitely and my grandma, they taught me well, but there was a component I just knew in my gut was missing. And Lynn Grabhorn uh, teaches how important emotions are and the emotional uh, component. 
feeling the feelings of having the things that you want. And that is a direct uh, line. I mean, it's not a line, it's a teaching from uh, Esther Hicks and the teachings of Abraham, which uh, unfortunately for the time when Lynn Grapper published that book, she briefly, and I mean briefly, in the original editions, it doesn't even say, it just says the Hicks family in Texas with a P.O. box. It is very brief, but I, I understand from what I've learned in, in the 20 years since uh, first really diving into the book or 17 years, whatever it is, uh, Lynn Grabhorn's feeling was that if she told people uh, how Esther and Jerry and Abraham, that it's channeling, people wouldn't buy her book. And she probably was right for back then, obviously, again, years before The Secret, late in 1999, a very different kind of uh, world as far as what we all had access to as well. Anyway. This book was great because it, it, it really went through and explained in a very concrete way um, the idea of where our emotions and our feelings fit in to our manifesting. And I locked in uh, about 100 pages in. I, my dad always had highlighters in the truck. I was just highlighting highlights. Finally, I stopped because the whole book was yellow <laughs> after 100 pages. And one thing that I, I, I read about was the very core original idea of scripting, which is what everybody knows and has heard about, and it's this. So uh, normal uh, old school scripting is the idea of talking out loud, wherever you are, for about 10, 15 minutes and really getting to the feeling place of having what you want. So for instance, if you wanna be president, I use this example in the book, uh, not just uh, Grabhorn or, or, or Abraham, but a lot, most teachings that talk about scripting, all of them really, uh, they propose you just stand in your room or go somewhere where people can't hear you because you sound crazy and talk out loud as if you're on the phone with a really good friend explaining how great it is that you just had your inauguration dinner and, you know, using the example of the president, whatever it is, and get yourself emotionally into this space of having it now and, and, and feeling like you have it. And that eventually the thoughts create the feelings, the feelings create the emotions, the emotions create the things back into your life. So that's the very bare bones thing. And what I did was I barely participated in the beach part of the vacation because I read this book two or three times in, in, in a couple days. And I kept locking in on this idea of scripting. And there was the two main things uh, were finally clear to me, which was, oh, my emotions and my feelings are really important. That was just such an aha moment uh, at Harvard when we were, we had a little break between the videos, I was telling you how um, I even still to this day, because it is such a natural part of, of creating things in our life, with whatever method you use, for me at least, emotions, uh, the importance of emotions and feelings as far as they, they guide us, they're a guidance system in a way of letting us know when we're closer or further away from what it is we're attracting, but they're also part of the fuel to actually bring it into our lives, which I go into depth about in the book. Um, but I forget sometimes when I'm teaching people to mention, right? I mean, I always get reminded, I always remember, but it's it's interesting because now it's such an ingrained part. I do see why sometimes it may be accidentally left out because as a teacher myself now, it's it, it's something that just seems so basic, but I understand it's not for a lot of people. So that, that solved that little puzzle and scripting was, there's a lot of exercises in this book. All of them, again, uh, you know, heavily borrowed from the Abraham teachings, but really interesting. She put a twist that was very grounded for the time and, and brought, and she, brought so many of her own examples into the book that it, it, it helped. I just, it really made it very approachable and, 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 and it, much easier to understand, at least for the time. And even, even today, it holds up really well. But I got home, I was still in this fight with my friend. And um, it sounds so silly. I'm very aware that a high school fight, but at the time, this was such a moment. God, if I knew what this stupid fight and this book would have done in my life, you know, I was 15, I'm about to be 32. My goodness, thank God that fight happened. It's, it's funny to talk about it though. Uh, so I got home and I, I had not had a moment alone. I really wanted to try scripting, which was this talking out loud thing. So very long story short, uh, I went into my bathroom, I turned the water on and I started pretending I was on the phone with my best friend and everything was fine. And that uh, we ended up going to a different, we went to the, she had a, a at a beach house in the Jersey Shore that we went there and went to a different boardwalk than we normally do. And I started putting in all these weird little details that I don't even know why I did it, except I, I'm pretty sure it was a test out to see like how accurate this was. 
So as soon as I was done, I hopped in the shower and within 30 seconds, my flip phone rang. This is 2003. And um, it was my best friend who had not contacted me at all. And literally, and, and it's, it's a really fun story. It opens the book, but every detail, every weird detail down to going to different boardwalk and, and the amount of pizzas that her dad ordered and, and where we were and who we saw, everything happened. So I was not happy. I was spooked. I was super freaked out, beyond freaked out. Then I had this feeling, you know, I'm 15, mind you, I was like, wait a minute, does everybody know this? And I, it's just me, like, is this what everybody uses? Or does nobody know this? What's happening? And I would, I would go and hide if something was weird or wrong. On the, so we went down to the shore and I would script out loud and then things were moving and I just couldn't believe it because I thought, this is what? Like, why? Where? Wh what's going on? It's either everyone knows this that isn't telling me or I don't know what's happening. Just no one knows and this is it. Here we go. I figured it out. Um, so it worked really well. And then a few weeks later, I made the mistake of telling my friends about it and they all laughed and laughed and laughed. And basically I just decided I'm gonna put it away and not worry about it. So uh, about a year later, year and a half later, um, I, I don't wanna spoil the story in the book, but basically let's just say the, the uh, Excuse Me Life is Waiting book popped up when I was now living in LA in a really unique way. Um, and I finally said, okay, all right. You know, and there have been a lot of signs pointing me to something there. Obviously, clearly, even here we are, this interview, I'm talking about my book that talks about this book. There was a reason uh, I attracted all of this stuff in my life. But so what happened was I was in LA and I switched from theater to, to film and TV acting and I was doing great. I mean, I had a lot of, I had a lot of things uh, going well. And I used my mom's, uh, I, I, I just was really, I, it was stupid now looking back, but I was embarrassed at the time. So in that year and a half in between, I was using, uh, I think a little bit more laborious techniques, but they, they work, but they're very much uh, old school, if you will. Um, just mine. I was afraid of my emotions a little bit because they clearly worked well. I, it was a weird year and a half, but I did still manifest and managed to get to LA and get a fantastic agent manager and team and all the things that I wanted. Um, and then the book basically reappeared in my life, if you will. And you could, yeah, I know you know the story, but anybody out there, it's one thing I don't want to spoil. It's a good book. So uh, I started scripting because I really wanted to apply it to acting and what I wanted and all the different things that I wanted. And it was really annoying because uh, it worked, but only five to 10% of the time. But it was enough that, and you know, it's like when you land on something that you know there is something there but it's not a hundred percent, but you, it's not zero either. And it's not enough that you can just throw it away. It's too much because you know, there's something there. So it was driving me bananas basically because I didn't like the idea of feeling like a crazy person talking to myself in my studio and then one bedroom apartment with my roommate about, you know, being a millionaire or whatever it was that I wanted, it, it, it was really difficult. Or in my, you know, a 1997 Toyota Corolla used car, I'm 16 years old. It felt really weird talking about at the time my Saab that I wanted to be out there remember Saabs. And then Ferrari, as I, I learned more about cars, the, the gay guy in me had a little bit of a learning curve figuring out what a good car was. <laughs> um, but it felt weird. It didn't feel like it didn't feel natural to be talking out loud like this and just so clearly seeing your environment around you was not at all near where you were. And with that, two things are true. That was true, but also five to 10% of the time, there was so many details and things that would happen with the scripting that I couldn't just let it go. So uh, 16, 17, I had a um, fantastic meditation group down in Laguna Hills, a store called Awakenings, which is still there. And I um, had a mentor who, who, uh, who led the group and it was just a meditation group. It was just, you know, I was the youngest one there by about 30 years and, you know, I was 16, 17 and I had a lot of friends and that were, you know, these, these wonderful women who, who all lived around. I think I was the only guy besides the teacher, um, come to think of it. But I would tell them about, you know, we would talk about manifesting. And again, this is right now about a year before The Secret came out. Um, but it was, you know, uh, Asking It Is Given by Esther and Jerry Hicks had just come out in 2004. There was this momentum going forward, but it really hadn't, the law of attraction hadn't hit the mainstream yet. Um, and I would talk to my friends uh, about what I was doing and all their methods. And we would kind of compare notes and stuff. And this went on for about a year, but scripting was something I kept coming back to. And I, I just couldn't figure out 
why of all the things, like I was, I, two things, I couldn't figure out how to make it work right. And I couldn't figure out why I cared so much. So there was like two really interesting kind of components going on. So uh, Secret came out. And I remember because uh, a lot of the, the, everyone lived in Orange County or LA County in 2006. It was the weirdest thing. I mean, Wayne Dyer was down here. Uh, every single author, I think at Hay House, like everyone you can imagine was here. It, it, it was around us. And I remember when uh, the DVD came out and I was, everybody was talking about it because a lot of friends of mine who were teachers or authors like Judith Lakomsky uh, was my friend who wrote, uh, great book on crystals back in I think 05 and she got one in her mailbox they were sending them out to teachers brilliant idea you know it's all these wonderful teachers and she's like you have to watch this movie Royce you gotta do it I'm like okay what's the secret she's like just watch it and then I watched it, it was a law of attraction it's fantastic but I was like oh well, that's kind of cool that I already knew about this I, I was I was excited that other people were starting to catch on and uh they didn't talk about scripting per se but vision boards were great and, and all these different tools they were giving people and then it exploded in 2007 I was very frustrated because I was working, I was getting jobs here and there, but there was bigger roles and always come down to me and one other person out of hundreds. And then the other person would seem to get it. So I knew I was doing something right, but it was, a lot of people don't know this. I, I mentioned this in the book, but with, with acting, um, you will go out for the same audition. Uh, and this has, this literally happened to me more than once. Two different Steven Spielberg movies, for some reason, on the same day, I had a soap opera audition. So there's not really a, a scale of, you know, people think, oh, if you're auditioning for an Oscar winner, then you're not auditioning for a soap opera or whatever you want to, you know, use. But the reality is every actor and actress you know, that's, that's how it is. Like, when, especially when you're starting out, it just kind of, I always say, throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. That's kind of the, the mentality, but it's great, especially when you're young. You know, you're getting experience, everything. And, and you know, my agents thought I was so successful because I was getting screen tests for everything, getting to the final. I was just frustrated because I was like, I know I'm good, but there's another component here. And I, I know it's attraction. I know it is because these people who are booking it, a lot of them were my friends. They had this other, no one really talked about it. I found out much later that a lot of people were utilizing some method of law of attraction and some technique like scripting. Uh, but at the time, no one really was talking openly about it. So um, I had been auditioning going in for uh, Disney Channel had Hannah Montana with Miley Cyrus was everywhere, if you remember. And uh, even people who didn't watch Disney or care knew Hannah Montana. So I had gone in a couple times for uh, to be play one of her boyfriends. And around this time, I knew there was a show coming out uh, at the time, it was called The Amazing O'Malley's, and then they changed the name to, uh, the, I think it was called Just Wizards, and then it became Wizards of Waverly Place, but uh, it was starring Selena Gomez, and I remember how excited everybody in town was. It's, Hollywood is the biggest small town in the world. It's just a very small town, but it feels from the outside looking in very large, And but everybody kind of, you know, they, we, we support each other, and we get excited for each other, and I remember when Selena got the show, she was the youngest person to sign with CAA, which is one of the best agencies in the world. And she was just so funny and everybody was taught, you know, just this is gonna be a, a really great show. It's gonna be very different. It's gonna be more for not just kids, it's gonna be for adults and teens. It's gonna be a real sitcom and blah, blah, blah. I wanted to be on it is the point. So I got, I went in uh, and I kept going in, same thing. And during, and I just wouldn't, wouldn't book a role or it was smaller roles. And uh, at, during this whole time, I had been uh, keeping a journal, just a regular journal, and just writing, you know, whatever happened during my day or in my night, whatever. And um, I had figured out that if I wrote in the morning uh, what I called and call now still a want list, which is basically uh, three to seven, sometimes more, but I always tell people out there and anybody I'm coaching, three is just fine, especially when you're starting because you're not, I don't know if I, if I have, I've had times in my life where I maybe missed a week. It's almost like you start to reset. You got to clarify a little bit more. So you're not going to know everything you want right away. So three, three to seven wants, and I always frame them as intentions, um, which is actually something I learned from uh, Wayne Dyer's book, The Power of Intention. And I sort of made it into my own thing, combining it with what I knew worked with, with have writing down your goals, but I made it a daily thing and I turned my wants into intentions. So, you know, if I, uh, wanted to weigh, this is an example, uh, my healthy goal weight of 150 pounds, uh, I would write, I intend to weigh my, uh, I would intend to weigh my goal weight of 150 pounds healthfully and happily or whatever. Um, but turning into a tent, an intent gives it more 
power and it, give, it gives you a lot more confidence when you're writing because it's a declaration as much as it is uh, uh, something that you're stating to the universe as almost having already. And it takes away that word, I want this, I want that, because that's squarely focused on the don't want, which is something that uh, when Grabhorn writes about as, as, as being a tricky kind of situation for a lot of people who, who she worked with. And that's why I sort of landed on changing your want list into an intention list. I still write at the top, but I'd, I'd figured that out. So that was working. And then, uh, all this stuff was Disney was going on and I was like on a mission to, I had just done a, a really big pilot for what was about to become the CW. And it was just this really interesting time where there's a lot of stuff up in the air. I wanted to either be on that show or do something with Disney. And I was hell bent on figuring out my method for the law of attraction, what's going to work for me. So I had this intention list and then I, I had this realization that I need to believe it wasn't really a realization as much as how do I, verbalize this or put this out there in a different way what I'm writing so what I would do is uh, and I would always have seven intentions usually maybe more maybe less but always around there I would take two or three of the daily intentions and you're just literally it's a notebook I mean literally look I got <laughs> right here I always I always have them with me but uh you know I always just use a mead notebook and um I would take two or three of the ones that I had and I would write down the ones that I believed were the closest and it's a really good tool uh, for, for anybody out there, because you will find as the days and weeks go on, because your want list can change every day and your belief list can change, but you'll start to notice the same beliefs start going down day after day. And then those are the things that start to come in more. Um, so I was doing that and I was still scripting out loud in the car. That was where I basically I would just be, Oh, this is so wonderful. But again, it just felt really like if I'm talking about being on a soundstage and I'm in my car, you know, stuck in traffic, it just, it, there was something missing. So I was at my meditation group and I said uh, to my friends, I was like, I really, I really need to figure out what it is with scripting and why I can't let go of it. Cause I, it's, it works, but it doesn't. And uh, I ended up, we ended up going to the house uh, that night after class. And, and then we went back to my place and I was talking to the same friend and she's like, maybe you need to go and look in your journal and figure out what it was, like what you were doing when you manifest. Because I was always write down what I would do during the day. I would always write if I script it out loud. And I, I don't know what came over me, but I ran upstairs and I realized that the journal was the actual thing that I was looking for, not what was in the journal. Because what I realized is, and I don't know why this didn't hit me before, um, that if, I wrote down my script in the morning, the goal would be to have it match the journal at night. And it was just like, oh, duh, dummy. Like, that, you know, that's how I thought it was like, oh my goodness, this is so, and that's usually as, a, you know, a lot of people out there who study this now, usually the easier it is, the better it works. And that's usually the answer. Occam's razor, it's usually the simplest answer. And that's usually the correct one. Well, that was me and I was like oh my god I'm sitting here for 15 minutes talking out loud feeling like a nut and all I have to do is write two or three paragraphs in the morning and try to see what I could do with my feelings and emotions to make that match what I'm really writing at night so pretty much like that uh the next day I started so when I get up in the morning I would do my once my belief and then I would then I started my first ever script and I would just date it for that day so I'm just going to pick a date since you know people could be watching this whatever let's say it's uh, December 1st, uh, 2050, uh, I would wake up in the morning and I would pretend I was writing my journal at night and I would write, today was a great day. Um, and then I would start laying out what happened. Now, what I realized very quickly, and this was just sort of an inspired thing, and it mostly because I had so many auditions and appointments and things always coming up, that putting in what I call in, in my book, the magic of the mundane is one of the most powerful tools. And it sounds very, uh, it, it sounds like it's in juxtaposition to everything you learn about with, with manifesting. But I would say if you have a dentist appointment or you have a doctor or you're going to the grocery store, put that in your script in the morning because what it's doing is it's rewiring your brain to know what the scripting is. So what we talked about in part one with your RAF and, and, and your perception of what's going on, but it also helps reinforce the reality of uh, what you're creating when you're creating it. So if you're writing in the morning that you're uh, on a yacht that day, you know, in the Mediterranean, but you're really going to your dentist's office, it, it doesn't work. You have to make it realistic for what is going on that day. And it's a brick by brick approach. It really is a day by day thing. Um, 
about five days into it, it, it happened to be a, a Sunday night after an acting class. Um, I had this inspiration to, I wanted to push it further because everything started to come and I started to, the auditions, I was starting to book things and things were just, it was working. And I knew I was almost there. And I, it was only about a, about a week and it was working really fast. And I realized that I wanted to be able to add in things a little bit further than just one day. So I took out my notebook and I wrote, I figured out what the date was 10 days into the future. And I wrote back backwards essentially, but I wrote as if it was 10 days forward and just reminiscing essentially as if it was my journal still onto what happened. And you can see, uh, as I'm sure you did in the book, I have, I, I save everything. Um, so I, I have actually, we have the original scans from the journal and, and, and the scripts uh, from my notebook. And what happened next was just uncanny, literally, it still gives me chills. And in even uh, putting the book together uh, and going back to these, these original first scripts, it was just amazing because every, I was picking days out of random on a Tuesday or this and people that would call and, and auditions. And, and basically what happened was um, I got my uh, first audition for, for Wizards for that was for a, a, the lead guest star. It was a much bigger role than anything I'd been going out for before. And it was playing Selena Gomez's boyfriend, which was a lot of fun. It was a really, really fun episode. Um, and I, lo I loved the character and I really wanted the role. And I, I, I knew that it was going to work with what I was doing. So I, um, during the first week of this, I had my audition and then my first callback. And then I got a call to come back in, but it was going to be after the weekend. So I'd done one 10 day script and literally everything now with my day to day script and my 10 day was happening and I had this idea I was like do I wait 10 days or do I just do it again every Sunday night because it felt like I'd have more time because it's a little bit longer the 10 day scripts are anywhere between two and seven pages but it, it, I don't want that to scare people it really doesn't have to be that long I just I write a lot <laughs> um, so I did it again and that's really the, the the secret sauce is I was able to adjust so if you think about it this way, I wrote my first 10 day script on December 1st, right? Now we're on December 7th in our example and I'm dating it ahead to the 17th, but there's still three or four days that are covered that I'm still in for my first script. So you're starting to basically layer your time over each other with the scripts you're writing. And it allowed me to adjust anything that didn't happen maybe in the first 10 day script or if something just silly changed or something in my personal life changed, you know, because you're, you're incorporating everything or if an appointment came up or whatever, you're adding that in and just making an adjustment because you're, you're doing the 10 day script every week. So every seven days you're doing a 10 day script. So it's really, it becomes very easy to adjust it to what's going on. If anything, you know, trivial or little, or even big happens that you want to almost correct it or correct course or whatever. Uh, it's really good and easy to do in your 10 day script. So with that second 10 day script, uh, and again, all these are in the book. I ended up booking the role and, and I was on set and, 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 and with Selena and the studio taping, everything, and it was fantastic. The weirdest thing was uh, every date that I had written in this very inspired place. And you don't, I don't wanna, you people sometimes go, oh, do I have to write to get the dates right? No, it just really reinforced that this was working for me. Um, I don't get the dates right all the time, but the, the stuff always happens. Uh, but for this first really wow round of scripting, everything to the date of the taping to the date I was called to, to get the role and, and all of that happened and it all happened in in ways that I couldn't explain with how I had you know I was still I was God, 18 19 but my career before like I said I was I was I was successful a lot of people would be like that's amazing you know you're doing so well but this was what really and then from that point forward elevated everything to that level that I had been searching where I couldn't rationalize the only thing that changed, if you will, was adding in the scripting to it because I didn't suddenly find a new acting coach or, you know, there wasn't like anything that changed in my uh, career, if you will, except for this uh, addition to scripting. So um, it, I started to, to incorporate in my everyday life. And um, I, I, over the years, I, I had a good two or three year period where I stopped and my life went to hell in a handbasket. I'm not saying it was because I wasn't scripting, but you know, you lose focus. We all go through that. I think it was very helpful uh, for, for coaching and writing, you know, now uh, to, to have had a period where really I started very young and I figured out this method. And then I just was a guy in my early 20s who just thought, ah, I don't need to do it anymore, but always came back around to it. And I've incorporated other kinds of scripting over the years, which uh, 
people can read about in the book, like uh, a seasonal script. I always like to do one if, uh, like right now is actually great. Happy spring, uh, as spring or summer or whenever people are watching this, uh, you can write out, you know, for the, basically it's a quarterly script. You can do a monthly script, uh, just the one page. These are very simple tools, but what it's doing is, and we really covered this in part one, but now people who've watched both can uh, understand the connection is it's shaping and reshaping your perception, what you view in the world, uh, what comes in. Obviously there is some things that we can't explain. Uh, I am, every, every friend of mine either loves or hates showing me new methods or techniques because I always want to just dive into the science and figure out how it works. And, you know, there's things that, you know, we use their vi vibrations a lot in uh, law of attraction and everything. And I, I mentioned this in the book because I even use that word. And it's okay to, language is, a, is an interesting factor. Um, we might want to touch on this for a second, but uh, vibrations, there's not a whole lot of science to back it up. I was really depressed, by the way, when I found this out like very depressed because it was such a, an important part of my lexicon and what I, how I speak and what I believe that I was very confused that the science just wasn't there. There's a reason I mentioned that in the book because there is a lot of science to back up what I think vibrations are and what we're actually doing and, and getting in our lives. But I think we need to, to, to realize that it's okay to not maybe always use the, the words that we're so used to using, because there is new language and there's new ways of describing things. But um, the point essentially is that with, uh, with what we're bringing into our lives and with what we're using, um, there is a lot of very old language and there's a lot of very new uh, things that we're basically doing. And there's some science that kind of gets jumbled up in the middle. Um, and it's confusing when you start scripting or using any other tool because it can be confusing if you don't understand what is going on or if you have, I always say, and, I, and this is how I open the science section of the book, the second half of the book, uh, it's, it's purposely funny because <laughs> I say you know, everybody cherry picks quantum mechanics and quantum physics, which by the way are the same thing can be used interchangeably. Uh, and then I basically spend 20 pages going through it at what quantum mechanics is uh, because there is a lot to be learned and, and gathered from the, the world of quantum physics, but also there's a lot of other uh, technologies and sciences and, and areas of study that I feel only empower uh, what we're doing when we're manifesting and when we're scripting. And there's not really a need to carry with us science or words like vibrations. I love the word, but there are other words coming, I feel like. We talked about this, uh, not on camera too, just that the language is, is sometimes a barrier. Uh, you, were, you told me a great story, which I think is really relevant about going back to books from the 1890s um, that I thought was fascinating. I've had the same experience, which I don't know if you want to tell them, you probably should. Because <laughs> uh, it's really, I think it really speaks to the point of where we're at right now and how scripting and, and all of this stuff uh, that is that's really exciting that's coming into this world fits in. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right there because you can you can um, think of Ralph Waldo Trine, uh, who was writing in the 1890s and, and somewhat past. But in essence, other than some arcane language, you, you're essentially reading what you would have read in the 1970s, 1980s, 90s, yeah. and on on into the present. And that's what I find so thrilling about your approach in your book is these new ways new ways of understanding that, that I think absolutely um, do empower us in in, uh, in in great ways and I'm, I'm curious what is it do you think about the juxtaposition of the morning and the evening because in the in the morning you're you're, you're writing from the perspective of the night and you're saying, wow, this amazing thing happened. It was so cool. I'm so excited for this project or that project. But then at night, you're using the reality of what really happened. And you see in the book, over time, they start out far apart and then pretty soon they're syncing up. So what is it with that aspect? Because I think... Um, the second piece would be something that old school new thought would not really connect with, would not really understand. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I, ho I hope they do, but I, I agree. I understand where you're coming from. So what I think is happening, uh, I talk about in the book, which is this, uh, 
there were a lot of headlines when I was trying to figure out the time aspect of things. I'll start by saying I did not realize that the commonly, not just commonly, like the very accepted idea of time is the block universe theory, which is uh, essentially that everything has already happened. There's a beginning and an end, and we're just in a basically a slice of it. And that was very strange because I didn't remember learning that in school, but then finding out that that's what science that's what they think. I was like, this is very weird. Okay. Now, not every scientist, not every person, but the majority, the, it is like known as the commonly accepted theory of time. So that led me down uh, a research tunnel, if you will, of, uh, of time and understanding what it is and how it fits in. Now, Mitch Horowitz, who wrote my, uh, the forward to this book, uh, and for those of you out there who haven't got it yet, there's a, a twist ending like you would almost find in a a, a fiction book, but it's a nonfiction a book, but there's a little bit of a fun twist ending with the foreword that Mitch wrote. But um, he, he talks about the idea of maybe not manifesting as much as selecting, um, which I think I, I expound upon a little bit in here, but also my, my, my research took me to some really interesting places. And you read these articles in these very respected, venerable publications and, 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 and Nature Magazine, you know, some of the, like the most premier uh, number one top, whatever you want to say, uh, science publications and magazines, and you're reading things such as, uh, you know, the future affects the past, uh, retro, uh, about your retrocausation, you're reading about uh, not just quantum physics, but also audiologists, and people who study hearing are learning that, and they're seeing that we somehow, they don't know how, but they know we're doing it, our brain is hearing what you would say to me, or I would say to you, before you're even having the thought of what you're going to say to me, or at least as far as they can measure. So we're well, hearing- It was absolutely mind boy when I saw that. It, that one to me is to be more exciting than a lot. I mean, I agree. It's, it, it literally blew my mind reading about that study. It's in the book. Um, and then uh, there's so many researchers that have went back to quantum mechanics and figured out that essentially time, it's a mess. Like it is, like, I, 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 I laugh, but it's true. And I, I, I mentioned this too in my writing that there's a, even physicists and, and, and many people who study time are, are at the point where they know there's something new coming because it is, everybody's just sort of in this very weird place of everything is so opposite of what they thought it would be time included that they know the new framework is very, it has to be coming soon. And it is, it is. Uh, I, I touch upon a lot of it in the book. Uh, and time is one of those things that if you tell people everything's already happened, including me, uh, it's, it's, it, it doesn't really explain anything. And it makes me kind of shut down for a second. You know, if you're saying, oh, everything already happened. Also, you know, that's kind of depressing. If, if, if you're thinking everything's determined and deterministic and, or, and predestined, then why live? Like, why try? Why do anything? Um, and I don't believe that. I always, my analogy to myself is we have autopilot or drive. And autopilot, yes, I think there is a lot that can be, uh, and there's a lot of uh, really fascinating research that, that speaks to the idea of determinism and everything being set. But to me, that's sort of just an autopilot. And what new thought has always been and what uh, manifesting and, and all of the law of attraction studies and teachings have been uh, are, are really the, the the tools to take people out of that autopilot and put them in the driver's seat. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're creating our own reality. We are driving the, 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 the plane or the car or the boat. So with time, there's, I've noticed that a lot of uh, the earlier studies, even just a decade ago, a lot of the people who write about the study got really depressed. And I understand why, because there wasn't this feeling of a, a hopeful way to take back the reins, if you will. And what it turns out is they feel like there's basically, uh, it's not either or, it's and. And what that means is time as they're understanding it is really much more not circular, not a box, but sort of a shape that we really can't explain or quite understand yet. But the way that I like to look at it, Stephen Hawking, uh, his final paper, most people don't know this, uh, and I, I touch on it in the book, talks about he really avoided for decades of his career the idea of uh, parallel universes or different timelines basically choices uh, affecting what's happening and the idea of maybe in another timeline uh, I'm wearing a red shirt right now and you're wearing a green shirt that was always very uh, he didn't love that idea the idea of just being millions and millions of multiple universes but his final paper he 
agreed and figured out with his studies that there are multiple uh, dimensions and parallel universes. And I don't want to scare anybody by that. But what he meant was, you know, in this, again, in this universe, if you will, uh, someone, my partner could bring me an apple and for whatever reason I could eat it on camera or an orange and I find out I'm allergic to the orange and I end up going to the hospital and then I know I have an orange allergy. But then in the other reality, he gave me an apple and I never knew I had an orange allergy. So in that universe or dimension, I may go years before I know I have an orange allergy and it might be at a really bad time finding out. So there, the, I really encourage people to read the book because I think I write it better than I say it, but um, there is a lot, uh, the, I would say a lot, of, uh, a lot of scientists who before did not believe in the idea of a multiverse don't believe now that there are millions of multiverses or different timelines, but there is a collection, if you will, of maybe 20 or 30. And what I think from combining and looking at all the different kinds of scientists, not just quantum mechanics, but everything, it, and using the Phantom Bot and understanding where, where we are at with our perception, our creation, it feels to me like we are perceiving a set, if you will, of different timelines where different things happen. And those are options. So there might be hundreds, if not thousands, of different possible avenues, but we might only have access to maybe 20 or 30 at a time. And with manifesting and scripting and using all these amazing tools uh, in the New Thought Movement does is it helps us to, in my experience and from what I've taught and from my students, it helps us to basically pick the best timeline or dimension, if you will, where we need to be for our things or whatever we're, we're creating to come into our lives. Again, I write it a lot better than I speak it. That's why I'm a writer. <laughs> but um, with scripting, when you're writing in the daytime and the nighttime, uh, what I believe now is happening uh, is essentially when you are creating in the morning, because you only have right now there, you know, when we look back, it's easy to say we have a morning, you know, we wrote that in the morning and not at night. When you're writing in the morning, you are altering your perception. So you're doing a couple things. You're reprogramming your brain. You're using the reticular activating system, the mind's filter that we talked about in part one. And you are saying, yo brain, start looking out for these opportunities and things and events, or if anything's already in my perception, you know, look for the good in it, if you will, but also find these things. And, you know, we use the example of uh, my student, the realtor uh, in part one, you know, there was an example of her wanting something that was already in her environment. And all these cooperative components were right there for her. And it just took her essentially writing it down and explaining it to her own mind, not to filter this out for it to just come right in. So when we're writing it in the morning, we're in the now and we're rewiring essentially our brains. So we know that much. We know we can program, if you will, our minds to start perceiving and, and alter our perception to, to, to show us things that are already there. It's not some woo woo stuff, it's there. It's just now that we know how the mind works and how perception works even a little bit more, we're able to kind of use it to our benefit. And time is very fluid and we talk about this, I talk about it at length in the book. Um, we are, there is something happening and there's a lot of studies, they don't know the exact mechanism, but where the future is affecting the past and the now is affecting the future. So when you're scripting, that, that was sort of the key that I was looking for for so long, which is why I waited a while before I've had people ask me to write about this before because all my friends and family, I mean, I, you know, just this is something so exciting, obviously, to me that I, I've taught this forever to, you know, privately. Uh, it's really just the last few years. And then Mitch finally kicking me in the butt and saying, you really need to write a book on this because he had the, the, he had the classic thing happen, which is what every friend of mine has um, that uses it within a few weeks, the morning and the morning script, the, you know, imaginary script and the night forensic, very real journal begin to come together and, and be, you can't even tell which one is which, except for the fact, at least in my case, one's in a, a smaller journal and one's in the red notebook. Um, and, you know, people get very excited by that. And then they immediately ask them what's going on with the timing of it. And I think that it's okay not to know exactly where we are with affecting the time and because it makes people feel a little eh, but I don't think everything is in a box and, and science really is getting to the point where they're realizing that there is a mechanism. I think we're creating not just in our own future, but there's some aspect of ourselves that is creating in our now from wherever, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of terms, you know, higher being or your inner being or your, your, your higher self or whatever. I think we're cooperating with the, the part of ourselves that we 
maybe can't perceive because we're much greater than these bodies. And we know that from science, we know we're much greater than our minds. We also now know uh, that we're not perceiving everything around us. So I think it's, it's, it's almost like an aspect of ourselves is helping ourselves uh, and we help ourselves anyway. And that's why it's weird to talk about it like this or even your brain is being separate, but it helps to understand sort of when you lay it out sort of more flat, it might not be exactly what's going on but when you look at it from, okay, I'm gonna program my brain, that sounds like a separate entity, but it does help a lot. I mean, at least in, in, in practice uh, to, to work this uh, manifesting system, if you will, out and, and bring things in. So I, I, I very close to figuring out exactly what's going on with time. I think I'm gonna get it in my lifetime, but I'm, I know that we're affecting, time is, is, is somehow not linear. We know that, and, and the science knows that it's not linear, and they're really, really close to figuring out. I know with quantum computers, uh, we're going to have a whole world of, of new information when it comes to time. I'm so excited. Like I, 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 Even with the Phantom Bot and going out, I mean, we adjust time. I always say we time travel every day. Everybody does. We're moving through time constantly. Our brains are the ones that are perceiving it as being linear, and that's not some wacky conspiracy thing. That's, yeah, there's everything backs this up in the medical world and the science world. It's just, it's, I understand as a writer, it's hard sometimes to be like, hey guys, uh, time is not going in the order you think it is. And for some reason, the future is affecting you now. You know, it, it, we're getting there, but it's, I, I understand why. And also what we talked about in the first uh, part, you know, there, there's been such a divide, not even purposely, but just between science and spirit that no one was really looking in the other direction. And I think that's where we're finding a lot of connections and uh, the spiritual studies and the new thought world helping the science world and the technology world to, to understand. Because like you said, there are books from 130, 40 years ago that I have the exact same experience where I've read them and I'm going, oh my God, this is exactly right that they had it. They knew it. They didn't have the language uh, to explain it. Well, I have, there's a quote uh, I'm not even going to try because it's brilliant by Walter Russell from the Universal One, which is a book I want to say from 1910. It's right around there. I, it's a very big book. I have it. It's, it's a big blue book. But he talks about how language is one of the greatest barriers to understanding new ideas because we don't always have the words to describe what it is that we're discovering, inventing, or finding out about ourselves and our place in the universe. And once we get the language, historically, things progress a lot further because once everybody has agreed upon word or phrase or whatever it is to describe what it is that's happening, uh, we all sort of get on the same boat and go. Um, and I think we're getting there. And I think that, you know, hopefully uh, people read the book will, will have some new words and language uh, to explain what's going on. And uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm always researching and studying. So I, I've worked a lot, thanks to you, Harv. I, I the first part of an article, and I started the second part for your website and literally wrote an entire book. So you're getting the second part, but uh, thank you, because the research just became so cool and amazing that I literally was spending months on this article, and then I was like, oh, crap, it's 100,000 words. Probably too long, but thank God for Harv Bishop, because I wrote a second book because of you. Um, and uh, every, every time I'm researching, I already have notes for the third book, because I know there's, it, it's just, the studies and the, the technology and everything that's going on is so exciting right now. And it should be really exciting to people who are in the new thought movement, who study law of attraction, who study uh, all of the ways of creating our own reality, because this bridge that's happening between technology and science isn't scary. It's really, really exciting. And I think that's important for people to, to understand. Yeah, that's a, I'm already looking forward to the second and third books based on how much I enjoyed and got out of this one. I'm curious, do the tools need to shift? I mean, yours continually evolve. You're evolving into new systems. So you're still using the basis, but I'm wondering if the habituation that you talk about, the, the need to, to break out of norms, uh, I mean, I, if, if, if something stays static, does it become less effective just because of that? It's a really, really interesting question. Um, I think tools can always evolve. Uh, I do think that there, are, you know, look, you can use a hammer or a power drill. They both can do the same thing. One is more powerful and can do more faster than the other, but it doesn't negate the idea of uh, a hammer. You will, you need a nail or a screw for both, or you know, it, it's a lot of analogies to be set to there. So I think some tools, the proverbial nails, 
probably won't change. Others, you know, will evolve. And some things, you know, we don't need to hammer things in with a stone anymore. That's why we have hammers and we have drills. So I don't think it negates it. I think, honestly, the way our brains work, you know, you want to keep them active. You want to keep them interested. That We all know that. That's not is something I'm, that's not profound. That's just the truth. We want to always be expanding and we, we are humans. We get bored. We are curious by nature. No, the most, the, per, the most bitter closed up person is still curious whether they want to admit it or not. We all are. And I think that that's why I really encourage everyone that I work with and I teach to be open to the technology and science worlds because they look at what you manifest every day. Can you imagine going back in time? And I, I say this in the book, but it's true saying that you could be on this magic glass screen, an iPad, and go uh, on this site, and then you could think about a mug, and you could click that mug on Amazon, and it's there in two hours in some cities. I mean, literally, that is that is the definition of, of manifesting from not even that long ago. We are thinking of things and literally bringing them into our lives within an hour, seconds, even quicker. Look at the internet. I think the tools are changing. I don't think it's a matter of whether we're changing them. I think that the tools are evolving and it's more of a, a question individually of whether you want to test and try the new tools out uh, or you, you, you know, if something works for you, I don't recommend throwing it away, but I do think it's good to be open to uh, the world uh, as a whole form. And, and, and that includes science and tech and those, those, those areas of study and those areas because they're not that far away from us. And I think the tools are changing. I think we're getting new tools and the ones that work will always have a place. I mean, scripting, you know, went from a notebook. Uh, I, I did it on my computer for a few years. I'm back to notebook because I like it better. That's just my own personal weird thing. It doesn't work better or less on either though. I was afraid when I started doing it on the computer, oh, maybe just slow. Nope, didn't do anything. It was a lot quicker though. Uh, cause you know, I type really fast and it's a little bit faster. So the focus for me, I, I needed to have the notebook cause it's a little bit more time, which I just personally prefer. It doesn't affect anybody that I've worked with though. So, uh, you could use it either way, but you know, I think that the core is the same, which is we are in control of our reality. We're bringing things in and that is it. At the end of the day, whatever technique or tool or method we're using, it's still ultimately us we are still the ones doing it and that will never change that we are have this power and this ability that is fascinating and amazing so the tools might change but the the core tool if you will is us i mean our brains and our mechanisms that we work with and we operate with um and i think it's just amazing i mean this is a silly example and let me tell you how against i don't even know why smart home i was for ever. I thought the idea of technology taking over this, it was just very, I was very, like a lot of people, I didn't know, I didn't understand it. This is a long time ago when smart homes, 10, 15 years ago, people were starting to talk about the idea. This was a long, long time ago. The idea just freaked me out. Uh, we recently uh, made our whole house is smart, everything, you know, the lights to, you know, there's, I don't even want to say her name, but the Amazon assistant, because she'll start talking if I say, because there's one right here. Uh, you know, and we, you say, it, I can just literally out loud say, smart assistant name i don't want to say on the video what time is it what's the weather what uh what does this mean if i need a definition it's crazy when i started to apply my smart home to writing and manifesting and working like oh my god this is so cool uh you know i could change the colors of this room right now i can make the light you know we have the smart bulbs we can make them green or red you know it's really neat i'm very into i love studying feng shui it's just one of my hobbies i, I love um the flying star school and that's where it changes every year. So there's always colors that you want in the room. And it's really neat having smart light bulbs because that's what, if I need the room to be green or whatever, I can make it green for a few hours a day. I mean, it's silly, but it's, it's, it's really cool. This tech has really shifted my view of what manifesting is. And I think that's happening for a lot of people because again, the idea of just out loud saying, hey, what time is it? Or what's the recipe for, you know, whatever a hamburger or pasta or whatever you want to make, like it's just there for you. And we're manifesting this in our reality. So I think that anybody who studies new thought or law of attraction needs, needs to come to, uh, not come to realization as much as just like embrace the idea that maybe we've attracted this amazing technology into our lives because it does make things easier and easy things always manifest very fast, I found. And so when our world around us is a lot easier to operate in, we have more time to focus on all the really fun stuff. So 
that's just an example of, for me, where my, my growth of just thinking that was the worst idea and I was going to have headaches all the time and there's going to be some takeover. No, it's awesome. You know, we have like 10, a lot, oh, I was 10 of those Amazon things and we have all our lights and our, uh, we even have, uh, we have probably way too much. We have the doorbell and the cameras and this and that. And it's not some scary totalitarianism like state in my house. It's amazing. We have, it's just so cool. The TV is smart. I can ask it to turn on a channel or pick a movie out or show me a video. It's great. So I, I think that we're manifesting in ways that we forget just a decade or two ago, we would have been blown away at the idea of just manifesting that technology. So I think it's a little bit of a framework switch too that's going on of what constitutes as manifesting. To me, all of this is, but we're also used to it now that we forget how amazing this is, this world and this tech that we're, we're experiencing now. And it's, it's incredible. Well said. One thing I wanted to ask you about, and, and you're one of the few people I've ever seen address this, and I've seen it addressed a few times among people more focused in magic than new thought, but that there's sometimes with, with great manifestations, there's blowback. And you talk about your first week on Wizards of Waverly Place, and, yeah, and my life you're like, happen. my dreams are happening, but there's two or three things this week that don't feel good. So can you talk about that? Yeah, What's up with it? Diane and I had a, a similar case of we did some manifestation work around selling a, a home in, in the mountains in Colorado that we absolutely had to sell by a certain date. And and it the, within one day of, of uh, doing some work, it was like so much better. And then suddenly the next day, well, this might be in that. Yep. Yeah. It was so the, the, we felt like we were on a roller coaster. And, it, and you're not alone. And, you know, I'm glad you brought it up. And it's funny because uh, even in the article I wrote, the Mimi meme for you, I talk about this a little bit because I think it happened so quick with me with my manifesting work that it just kind of became something that I was very hungry to figure out. Um, like you said, my first week on Wizards, I, my dreams are literally coming true. And uh, the other dream of figuring out scripting and manifesting and seeing it happen was coming true. There are so many things happening. But uh, my personal life, the relationship I was in at the time was in chaos and my mentor died literally that week. It was just a mess. And I couldn't rationalize how this incredible thing, like you just said, this other I've worked at for so long was happening, but also these really horrible feeling things were happening. It just didn't make any sense. Um, in the second book I, I dive into a lot and actually, uh, the article I wrote for your website, if anybody wants to check it out, uh, part one and part two, which is almost there for real now, uh, probably by the time they see this, because it's going to be there in the next week or two, um, is about what I figured out was going on. So uh, most people here, I just very briefly, uh, the word meme, and they think of a picture uh, with, with words on it. And as you know, because of what I've written, what we've talked about uh, for your site, uh, memetics is actually this fascinating world of study and a real scientific uh, realm, if you will. There are the U.S. Army has a handbook on uh, memetic warfare, and, and people go, well, wait, what is it? Memetics, I don't think, are talked about as much because they, they can scare people a little bit when they realize what the theory is behind it. But after you understand it a little bit more, and there's a whole chapter in my book about it um, that really takes, a, I think, a, a decent deep dive into it. Um, but for me, I was trying to figure out why bad things seem to happen with really good manifestations, not all the time, but a lot. And everyone I know was having the same thing. And no one talks about it. Like you said, people, you know, most of these books, they, they don't like to mention that part where, oh, and my life was going to hell and all these other areas, because I get it. You know, it's everything happened in the time you did in this world for a reason. But I do think it's important to bring it up. And like you said, uh, in, in the world of magic and the occult, they talk about it a little bit more, but I was trying to find something a little bit, for me at least, uh, with a little bit more of a scientific under or whatever groundedness or background to, to explain it. So basically, usually when things are going bad in other areas of your life, when you're manifesting, uh, memes are to blame. Memetics uh, is, is, is usually where you can go to figure it out. So in, in, in very, very briefly, and I encourage everyone to go, read the articles on uh, Harv's site that I wrote and chapter nine in my book. But uh, the articles are plenty, I think, to, to get a grasp. But basically, the memes can be anything. They are units of culture the way that genes are units of biology. So our 
uh, if we have genes, that's our DNA, that's we have an evolution that's going on biologically. Well, what they've discovered is that memes are units of culture that have evolved over time. And memes can be anything. They could be bell bottoms or microwave dinners or songs or really catchy phrases or words, trends that come into uh, you know, bell bottoms in the, you know, the late 60s and early 70s and, you know, whatever thing that you want to culturally uh, that you can't explain by evolution, like going to the opera or building roller coasters, none of that makes sense for our survival. Um, you can look and find it in the study of memetics. And people, I know myself, it was, it's, it's a little confusing because it's very big sounding, it's very broad when you first hear it, when you're really understanding what it is. Um, but I kind of... <laughs> I went through all the books. I've read everything that you could possibly humanly read anywhere on, on this, every legitimate study and, and, and scientific book and paper and fun book. Um, and, and what it boils down to is we don't always create the thoughts in our head. So memetics actually, they jump like a virus. They call a lot of, there's good memes and bad memes. We all need memetics and memes to survive because it is our culture, it is our lives. Um, but you can catch a meme, and this is all scientifically, back, scientifically backed up. I, I write about it a lot. Uh, again, on Harv's website, you can see all the, the background. I think I have a lot of links on there. If not, I'll make sure we get them for Article 2. Um, but basically, what they landed on, what they discovered with memetics uh, over the years, it really just, it's a new form of science. It really emerged in the 70s, um, and, and it, it took a little bit of a break in the 90s. It really started to pick up speed. But we catch thoughts essentially from TV, from newspapers, from, uh, from each other, from what we tell each other. And, and one of the great books, um, Virus of the Mind by Richard Brody is from 1995 or six. Um, and it's my favorite personal book on memes. It's the easiest to read, but it also just, it gets to the point really quickly. Um, and he says, you know, basically if you read a magazine, you catch a meme. If you listen to a song, you catch a meme. If you talk to each other, if you're a college professor and you, you do come with a great idea or you have a thesis, then you send it out to all of your colleagues. They're going to catch that meme. So where I, my mind got blown is that there's all of the scientific evidence that literally says we don't always create the thoughts in our head. So I was like, hold on a second. Wait a minute. If that's true, then that means we got to look at the whole foundation of manifesting because, you know, thoughts are things and we're using our thoughts, whether, it, whether you believe it's positive thoughts that create things in your life or like I do, it's thoughts create the feelings, create the emotions, which bring in, you know, whatever we're perceiving and bring into our lives and creating either way, thoughts are at the root of the two main core uh, schools of new thought, if you will, and law of attraction. And when you look at memes and you realize that not all thoughts are our own, we're, we're, it's so, it was so ingrained. I know into me, and it was just pushed like you can't create another's reality. But when I realized what was going on, when I, bad things would happen, it wasn't making sense because everything that I had in me that I was aware of was obviously like you just said with the with with your story and with the example that we both gave, we were doing everything right, but something really fell off. It's because I have found now I, I used to say nine times out of ten, but ten times out of ten, we've accidentally got we have some meme going on. Some and memes can really be weird because they they're tricky thoughts that basically we have a belief system or something that's been implanted or we've seen and we've in, in basically integrated into ourselves and don't even know it so it doesn't line up with our own and and i want to freak people out it's like you're infested with mind viruses everywhere but we do have so much information coming in from other sources that aren't ourselves that a lot of times i call it like an errant or, or stray meme will will start rearing its ugly head when everything else is aligned so there's couple of ways to get rid of them and the really basic way is and I, I was telling uh for those watching I was telling hard uh we had a little break in between part one and part two is it's interesting because a lot of these scientists and really uh you know very scholarly people who don't think about meditating uh when they got into the study of emetics almost all of them landed at this place of well the only way to get rid of them is to calm your mind and meditate because it quiets your mind enough to just basically release old thoughts. It's just like we do with our own thoughts, but they realize that when they would actually put it through studies and, you know, like you look, they look at cycles of inner city poverty. They look at terrorism. They look at all sorts of things. Like if you can imagine a topic, memetic supplies somehow. So you can meditate, but also with scripting, you are basically taking the power and the reins back. And what you're doing is memes don't like stick around forever. Once you're aware of them, I have found, uh, especially with everyone that I've worked with, once they are just made aware that memetics is a thing, 
it sounds funny, but they can use scripting, they can meditate. And I, I, I have a process in the book, the last chapter is called a picture script, which is my version of a vision board. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It's, it's really, really easy to do. Um, you know what, I think I'm gonna, I, I will do this because I've been thinking about it for a while, but I'm gonna post a, 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 an article on my, on my site of how to do it so people can just get to the bare bones, the, the really detailed versions in the book. But you could look on there. But anyway, that is one of the best ways to get rid of any stray memes. You don't have to know about them. You don't have to like relive your past and go figure out what article or what video you saw that put something in your brain that isn't working right. Um, you're always sort of replacing and, 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 and filtering out stuff. And once people take control with new thought, I figured out the worst meme of all is the one that they tell us. Uh, it's that belief that we can't create another's reality because it allows memes to basically replicate and come into our lives and screw up our reality. So once you're aware of it, uh, it's not a scary thing. It's just, uh, uh, it's just like you're know, brushing your teeth every morning or whatever, you know, just keeping the grime off essentially. And I found within a month or two of uh, scripting and just taking the control back as far as understanding what memes are, uh, things go a lot smoother. Now, there are sometimes when it needs a little bit more work and the picture script, uh, which is chapter 10 of the book, I'm going to put something up on my site with the instructions on how to do it. It's a really fun, quick vision board, basically, but it's, 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 I specifically designed that exercise to uh, eradicate any negative memes going on in people and in people I work with and for myself. And it works amazing and very quickly. Uh, and it is, for me at least, it solved all those little tricky, what's going on, why does bad stuff happen? Um, and again, I'm, I, I'm not doing it justice. I really encourage everyone to, to read the article or, or, or take a look at the book. Um, but it is, it's a really mind-blowing kind of uh, area of science that is really underrated and not talked about a lot. And most of the people who've studied it and really spent their life, you know, it's their life's work studying memetics, um, they know it scares people. So they think it just, be, they talk about it. It's very, it's out there, obviously. It's very, uh, it's, it's something that exists and it's very easy to access the information on. Um, one interesting meme that they, they discussed more recently is the fact that the word meme has been sort of taken and, and put onto this new definition idea of just these little online images. So the entire study, you could even say the whole, the whole world that is actually memetics is sort of covered by a, a, a somewhat harmful meme, which is the idea that it's the silly little thing, I don't have to pay attention to it. So uh, there's a lot there, you know, but um, uh, there are a lot of very simple tools to, to, to fix that. And, and I mean, I've noticed such a great success rate. That's why it's so much fun to talk about it because there, there's really simple tools. I thought it was gonna be hell. When I first started researching, I was like, oh my God, we're all screwed. We're totally screwed, but we're not. It's actually meditate, picture script uh, and scripting are really the best because you're rewiring not just in uh, images, but also with words and memes are really weird because I say this example in the book, if I say the name Kim Kardashian, anybody out there watching, are you seeing the words Kim Kardashian? Are you visual, you're seeing a picture of her, not 75% of the population is seeing an image of some sort of image of her. And basically what a lot of the really core new thought and law of attraction uh, techniques teach us is to uh, use a language that isn't native to us. So the, with memes, we, it's, okay, here's how I put it. So we've been using memes as far as like cave paintings or memes uh, since we were basically all of humanity for all of time, we have, uh, we communicate in images and, main, and language as we know it is a relatively new development. So our brains are like, I use this example too, the most sophisticated VCR in the world that is fantastic and you know plays movies beautifully. But if you try to stick a DVD in there or a book, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. It might break it even. So when we're just operating uh, on one level, basically if it's just words or we're just like thinking positive words in our head, the idea of adding images in, uh, it, it, it's important because it, talks to our subconscious in a way that it understands better what we want. So yes, scripting is a lot about words, but it gets you in the feeling place and it gets you visualizing very easily. So it's, it's weird because it's kind of a backdoor visualization technique in a way because you're writing, but because of how we think in pictures, it, it connects the two worlds uh, with my method of scripting. It really helps you to kind of ground them together, communicate with your subconscious a lot easier, which also helps you to get rid of anything negative mimetically, if you will, and uh, hopefully move into a, a new space uh, a lot easier as far as manifesting goes without any of the negative stuff.
That's another piece that Diane and I are, are very much looking forward to trying out. Um, so as, as a last question, is there, is there something you can share with us, a, a little taste of what's to come in the, in the, the next book? Yeah, when absolutely. we might expect it. I, I definitely think uh, Harv, of all people, you deserve it because <laughs> it's your fault, but also I promised everyone I'd have an article part two and then I ended up in the weeds researching this book. Um, so one of the, actually two cool things I'll tell you. Um, there is a technique we were actually talking about in the break called image cycling, which I started to become really interested in because it is basically visualizing but in a very very unique and different way where you're visualizing a lot of things very rapidly all at once there's lots of great videos and resources that's not new per se to but what i what i did was i took um the idea of image cycling and timing so we've been doing a lot of research and, and i've been studying the research of what you were and i were talking about part one uh you know are there better times of day to do things are there cycles and also how does our environment, because like I said, I've always been very fascinated. I've always I've studied feng shui since I was basically could. I mean, since I was very young. Um, and I knew that there was something going on with my environment that was affecting what I was creating, but I couldn't quite just put it to feng shui. So uh, if people want something really fun to do, uh, I would highly recommend looking into uh, image cycling. There's a lot of great resources on YouTube. Um, and I'm probably going to do a video on it in the next few months but the next book it takes all of us to i would say not even a new level as much as just it expands but it gives us a lot of extra tools that you know i don't like to put anything out there unless i've tried it and it works myself but image cycling i highly recommend again there's a lot of i don't even have one specific teacher i would recommend because they're all the core of it is the same um, a lot of people will study flow and flow state uh they, they they use image cycling to create and manifest things in their lives so what I did was I was writing the follow-up to the meme article and I fell down this rabbit hole that led me to this incredible world of, I hate the word, but it's what they call this, this holographic universe and this idea of visualizing and use, using images um, and how that actually appears in people's lives. But what I figured out was when I started studying and really like applying what I've learned from the study of our environment and feng shui and how our environment impacts our creations, when I combined that with image cycling and uh, with the ground and the knowledge of memetics, this crazy, amazing manifestations have begun to happen. And it's a whole other world that actually uh, uses technology and, 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 very, and free apps. It's, it's a whole different level. Um, and we're just finishing up, and I say we because I always, I always force my family and most of my close friends to do to try out all these things with me. <laughs> they like it now because they get you know they they're really good manifestors. But um, it's gonna be I, I'm not I don't know because you never know what you're gonna name a book I've learned. But you know it would basically uh, be the version of taking scripting off the page and into our environment uh, with some really cool uh, techniques like uh, image cycling. So. What, pe what I'm gonna encourage people to do is uh, if they wanna start peeking now, you know, look up image cycling and uh, there's a school of feng shui called Flying Star Feng Shui. Uh, Marie Diamond is fantastic. I know everybody knows her from The Secret. She's one of the coolest, most amazing. I wanna meet her so bad teachers as far as her videos and her content, but she this whole time has talked about this idea of a holographic world and applied it to the spaces we live in and occupy. And she really is the reason uh, that and the medics, the articles I, I've been writing for you that turned into a book that I landed in this amazing world of these teachers who study neurolinguistic programming, image cycling, and feng shui. And I kind of take it and combined it into something I think is going to be really awesome. I don't like people sitting, like, as you know, with my book, I, I, I like people getting up. That's why I love the Satan bot. I like being able to just jump right into action and being able to do it right here, like right where you are. That's what I love, especially right now with everything going on. I mean, it's it's even better because, you know, people need to be able to do stuff right where they are and start where they are and not spend a lot of money or have to leave the house really if they don't want to. Uh, and that's that's why I love uh, what I've been learning and what the next book is about because it's all about our environment. And it doesn't matter if you're in a studio apartment or a 10,000 square foot mansion or you have a yard or you don't, it doesn't matter how and why feng shui works and the energy of our environment works has blown my mind when you start realizing that again it's a situation of them having figured it out and it all connects to new thought and creation and it's like that extra thing that 
I think we all really have been searching for for a long time. I couldn't believe it because I, I, I just, it's so exciting. I don't want to spoil it all, but I, I highly recommend it. looks at image cycling and uh, flying star feng shui, and they'll probably get an idea of where I'm going. But there's tons of great image cycling meditations and, and visualizations that'll, that teach people how to do it. So do that now because the results are amazing. They're so cool. Awesome. Awesome. And absolutely uh, check out um, Royce's new book. I mean, it's, it's so, you know, it's the most exciting thing. You know, there's been a lot of exciting things come out the last few years, but I think this is along with uh, Mitch's uh, the Miracle Club, absolutely one of the best for taking a, 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 a dynamic and new approach to new thought. I mean, it's, 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 it's not old school anymore, folks. So <laughs> there's a lot to uncover, a lot to discover. And as much as we've done a deep dive on parts one and two, there is so much more that we could have talked about because it's so rich. And I never so, shut up, so I could talk forever. But yeah, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So hopefully we'll have uh, we'll have Royce back on in the future, and uh, and uh, we'll take some other deeper dives. Absolutely. Well, with everything going on, I mean, we, maybe we'll make this a weekly thing. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did uh, a deep bow to you, Royce, and for all your fantastic work. Thank appreciate, you. Thank appreciate you your cool. taking the time.